evening, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, tonight's lecture with uh, journalist Evan Weiner. Uh, tonight, uh, the lecture is the history of rock and roll. And uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here to tonight's Zoom. I'm um, Steve Spatero from the East Hampton Library, the uh, head of the reference department. Um, if you like what you see, uh, in these lectures, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's just East Hampton Library, and uh, you can look at uh, a number of the older presentations uh, that were done on various topics on that uh, website. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn over this evening's talk to Evan Weiner. If you have any questions, Please feel free to type them in the chat. And when we get to the end, uh, if you have any questions uh, and use the raise hand feature, uh, we'll unmute. So thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me again. And thank you for spending uh, part of your evening with me. My name is Evan Weiner. I'm a journalist. And uh, I, I've worked at radio stations where music was played, um, whether it was Al Ham's Music of Your Life or 1950s music or 60s or 70s. Um, that is the uh, Paramount Theater and Alan Freed. Can you imagine going to the show, Alan Freed uh, presenting Fats Domino and Jerry Lee Lewis and the Everleys and Buddy Holly and the Crickets and the Rays and Danny and the Juniors. And you know what? You could still see Paul Anker today. Uh, and maybe Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, he's still around. It's great to be young. Well, these guys aren't young anymore, but these guys were the backbone uh, of uh, early days of rock and roll. And Alan Freed was the disc jockey who coined the phrase rock and roll while he was in Cleveland. Sam Phillips, there he is. Sam Phillips was the guy who uh, founded the uh, Memphis Sun Record Company and uh, he is an important contributor to the early days of rock and roll, whether it's B.B. King or Muddy Waters or Elvis. Dick Clark, I don't have to talk about Dick Clark to you if you watch Bandstand. Bill Haley in the Comets, most unlikely guy to be a rock and roll star. He looked like the guy who is uh, behind the counter of the grocery giving you fish, but uh, Bill Haley and his Comets, uh, a major part of the early days of rock and roll. And there's little Richard Lucille and Chuck Berry doing the uh, good old duck walk. And of course, Elvis Jailhouse Rock. Rock and roll, bad influence. How many out there um, uh, in, in the audience tonight uh, consider themselves uh, fallen to, um, to a bad influence? Because rock and roll is the devil's music, beware. The hypnotic voodoo rhythm, a reckless dance down the devil's road of sin, self-destruction, leading youth to internal damnation in the fiery pits of hell. Ugh, the fiery pits of hell, because you listen to rock and roll music. But let's before we even get there, let's talk about what rock and roll music is. Now, this is the top 10 of 1950, and... Uh, I don't see one song there that would be considered rock and roll. Good night, Irene. Them Weavers were good. Uh, Nat King Cole, Mona Lisa. Nat King Cole could get a telephone book. Remember those? And, and just read the names, put some music behind them, and it'd be great. Third Man Theme, Anton Karras. Sam Song. It's really a bad song. Gary and Bing Crosby. Uh, also done by uh, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. And somehow Clyde got in there. I don't know how, but I guess Clyde was a name that the Rat Pack used. Simple Melody, again, Gary and Bing Crosby. Music, music, music. Uh, you know, Up-tempo a little bit. That could be a rock and roller. Uh, certainly Guy Lombardo and the Royal Canadians. We're not rock and rollers. Third Man Theme. Uh, Chattanooga Shoeshine Boy, Red Foley. Uh, Harbor Lights with Sammy K, and isn't it fair uh, with uh, Sammy K and Don Cornell? So that was the top 10 of 1950, uh, the biggest songs of 1950, and not a rock and roll song there. But there were guys out there in 1950 who were performing 
who might lay claim to the first rock and roll, like Louis Jordan, you know, five guys named Mo, is you is or is you ain't my baby, uh, among others. Uh, his 1949 song um, is um, Saturday Night Fish Fry, which I listened to the other day. It's considered to be a contender for the title of the first rock and roll record. Uh, but there were others besides Louis Jordan. Uh, there's this guy, Fats Domino. Rock and roll is nothing new. There's nothing but rhythm and blues. And we've been playing it for years down in New Orleans. As far as Fats Domino was concerned, rock and roll was simply a new marketing strategy for the style of music he had been recording since 1949. On December 10th, 1949, Fats Domino released what would become his first hit, The Fat Man. The title of the first rock and roll song open to debate, along with The Fat Man. Other contenders include Jackie Brenston's Rocket 88, Jimmy Preston's Rock the Joint, and Sister Rosetta Tharp's Strange Things Happen Every Day. We do know this, The Fat Man was one of the first rock and roll songs. And this guy is essential to rock and roll, Muddy Waters. Little, and he was a rhythm and blues guy. Little Richard said that rhythm and blues had a baby. Somebody named it rock and roll. A number of important R&B artists were part of the beginning of rock and roll, including Muddy Waters, Willie Mae, Big Mama Thornton, and Big Joe Turner. But Rocket 88 is pretty much accepted as the first rock and roll song. Um, and uh, it was Ike Turner and his band, but his saxophonist, Jackie Brenston, uh, was the vocalist, and um, he uh, called uh, the band, I called the band the uh, Delta Cats, and um, so this is supposedly the first song. Now, it does hit a lot of spots. In 1951, Rocket 88, song by Jackie Brinston and his Delta Cats, could have been the number one song in rock and roll. It was recorded at Sam Phillips Memphis Recording Service, it was the first number one rhythm and blues hit for the Chicago-based Chess Brothers, the Delta Cats, Ike Turner and his band, the King of Rhythm. Uh, Rocket 88 was the third biggest rhythm and blues single in jukebox plays in 1951, according to Billboard magazine, and ninth in record sales. All the song's lyrics, well, the Beach Boys did the same thing. And people in the 70s did the same thing. It's about cars about girls, about sex, about alcohol. Everybody in the car is gonna take a little nip. Uh, and freedom. Uh, it was designed to appeal to all teenagers. Now I've asked women about uh, the song Rocket 88. And uh, they said, well, uh, we might have been the girls in the back seat of that car that uh, he was singing about. And I said, enough said. Uh, it may have been aimed at boys, but the girls were listening. Uh, there are the Chess Brothers, Jewish immigrants from Poland who set up uh, the uh, Chicago-based uh, Chess Records, which was the number one uh, record company, blues labels, of the 1950s and 60s, Leonard and Phil Chess. Uh, they created a monopoly of Chicago music recording, doing sessions and releasing recordings by every major blues performer from Johnny Lee Hooker to uh, Elmore James, who cited in uh, the 1969 Beatles song by George Harrison uh, for You Blue, um, talking about uh, Elmore, J Elmore James is nothing on this baby, according to George Harrison. To Bud, Bo Diddley, to Jimmy Reed, and Chuck Berry was on the label. Howling Wolf, another of these Memphis guys, ended up Chess Records. Uh, the Chess Brothers created the label in 1950 and looked for talent outside of Chicago, although a lot of talent had moved from the South to the industrialized cities like Chicago looking for jobs. Um, they became acquainted with Sam Phillips, who later would be the founder of Memphis's Sun Records. Their greatest find in Memphis was Helen Wolf, who along with Waters soon became the biggest names in Chicago blues bigger than Jake and Elwood, uh, the Blue Brothers, uh, Blues Brothers. That's Big Mama Thornton. She's big, about six feet tall, 300 pounds, big voice. And before there was Elma, Elvis, there was Big Mama Thornton. 
Uh, she was called Big Mama for her size and her robust, powerful voice. August 1953, recording session in Southwest Los Angeles. She's approached by young songwriters, the songwriting team of Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. They offer her a 12 bar blues vocal called Hound Dog. The song was filled with open sexual references. Whoops and Barks was released. 1953 and soon topped the R&B charts. Despite selling 2 million copies, she only received 500 bucks, which now would be somewhere, oh, I don't know, about uh, $17,000. That's what she received for recording the song. Big Joe Turner. Big Joe Turner's big break may have, be may have come because uh, he failed at something. In April 1951, Joe Turner had an unfortunate gig at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. He was singing with Count Basie's band as a last minute substitute for Jimmy Rushing. The audience laughed as he missed cues, but the Atlantic Records head, Armit Edegon, was there. He wanted Turner on his label. In 1954, Big Joe Turner recorded Shake, Rattle, and Roll, which has become a rock and roll standard. There is Sister Rosetta Tharp. Well, by day, I guess uh, she was doing the Lord's work, and at night she's doing the devil's work. Uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp's first hit was a spiritual rock me recording with her soaring held notes and sexy growls back in 1938. Her 1944 release, Strange Things Happen Every Day, is a contender for the first rock and roll song, and uh, she had influence on the early rockers like Johnny Cash, Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, as well as the 1960s singer and 70s and 80s and 90s, Aretha Franklin. That is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I was there uh, 2017, and I took a picture of this poster. Not knowing I would ever do this talk, I just took a picture of the poster. And it's Alan Freed, because my background is radio, and I like things like that. And it's uh, Alan Freed's on there, and um, he's uh, inviting you to listen to the Moondog House. Heard nightly on WJW in Cleveland between 11.15 and 1 a.m., Blues, rhythm, and jazz. He spins him kip. He's hep. That freed. Uh, brought to you by Record Rendezvous. Uh, Alan Freed was one of these guys who was from Pennsylvania, who was around in the early days of TV and would do commercials or anything else that uh, his services could lend or he could lend his services to Cleveland TV, and he's on a radio station, he's doing Beethoven-type music, and they just bury him in the overnight shift, 11.15 to 1 a.m., and he comes up with something. In an effort to introduce rhythm and blues to a broader wide audience, which was hesitant to embrace black music, Cleveland, Ohio disc jockey Alan Freed uses the term rock and roll to describe R&B in 1951. Uh, it wasn't a new term. He just updated the term just a little bit. Freed called the rhythm and blues records he played rock and roll. Rock and roll was slang for having sex in the Negro community. In 1922, uh, there was a song sung by Trixie Smith called My Man Rocks Me with One Steady Roll. Featured the words rock and roll. 1951, you might want to listen to this one. 60 Minute Man, I'm your 60 Minute Man by Billy Ward and the Dominoes, the most uh, sexually explicit R&B hit to cross over into the pop charts. I'm your 60 Minute Man. Well, let's take it out of the studio. Let's go to the Cleveland Arena and let's have a show. And Alan Freed decides, let's, we're going to have a show. And uh, if you take a close look at that picture, really close look at that picture, you will notice that Alan Freed is the only white face in this crowd at the Cleveland Arena, and he's going to present a rock and roll show. It's March 21st, 1952, and the Moon Dog Carnation Ball is to feature Paul Williams and his Hucklebuckers and Tiny Grimes and the Rocking Highlanders, a black instrumental group that performed in Scottish Celts. Uh, tickets were buck fifty. 
oh, I don't know, multiply that by about 20 now, and uh, what do you get, a 30-buck ticket? And it was a Negro audience. They were surprised that Alan Freed, the DJ, was white. An estimated 20 to 25,000 fans turned out for the event being held in the arena with a capacity of 10,000. Uh, less than an hour into the show, the massive overflow crowd broke through the gates that were keeping them outside, and police quickly moved in to stop the show as soon as it began. Freed himself would narrowly escape criminal charges. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock rock, five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock rock. My granddaughter, my granddaughter uh, knows this song. She's three years old. I said, what time is it? One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock rock. Uh, Bill Haley, the most unlikely man to be a rock and roll hero. In fact, take a look at that band. That band does not have long hair and they're not dressed colorfully, but they were the stars, the rock and roll stars. Bill Haley and his comments were founded in 1952. He had been a country music performer after recording a country western style version of Jackie Brunston and his Delta Catch Rocket 88. Rhythm and Blues song, he changed his musical direction to a new sound. In 1953, he scored his first national success with an original song called Crazy Man, Crazy. Bill Haley, Evan Hunter, Blackboard Jungle all come together in 1955. Evan Hunter wrote the uh, book Blackboard Jungle in 54. Bill Haley and his comments recorded Rock Around the Clock in 1954. And the movie comes out in 1955. Uh, Blackboard Jungle. I'm sure you got uh, the book in the library and you more than likely have uh, the DVD of um, the movie in the library. Um, anyway, social drama film about teachers in an inter interracial inner city school based on the 1954 novel, The Blackboard Jungle by Evan Hunter. The movie highlighted violence in urban schools and helped spark the rock and roll revolution by featuring the hit song Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley in his comments. An idealistic teacher confronts the realities of juvenile delinquency. And rock and roll would pick up a reputation it doesn't want. The film hit a nerve with a brutal depiction of social conditions of urban schools. Fights and riots broke out in many towns in England where the movie was shown. The film was about juvenile delinquency and had an unusual amount of black actors for a 1955 movie and was Sidney Poitier's breakout performance. Bill Haley's song ushered in a frightening era for parents. Rock and roll was here to stay. And there is Bill Haley in his comments uh, playing before a crowd. The song, Rock Around the Clock, didn't grab much attention when it was released as a B-side, the other side of the hit side, so to speak, in 1954. But once it was featured in Blackboard Jungle in 1955, it quickly became a hit. It was the first rock and roll song to top the Billboard pop chart, and it's credited with introducing rock music to a mainstream audience. In April 1954, Bill Haley and his comments recorded a song with the title Rock Around the Clock as a late addition to their A-side single, single, 13 women and only one man in town. The song about a nuclear bomb blast that left only 14 people alive, 13 of whom were women, and uh, Bill Haley. And <laughs> Bill Haley, I hope Bill had some stamina. 13 women, that song sold around 75,000 copies. When MGM signed a deal with publisher Jimmy Myers for the use of the song Rock Around the Clock in Blackboard Jungle, it was not a well-known song. Oh, rock and roll had picked up, picked up uh, the reputation, juvenile delinquency. And uh, there were juvenile delinquency uh, movies that were put out by in Hollywood like this one. A girl delinquent, a jet-propelled gang out for fast kicks. Juvenile Jungle. Uh, starring Corey Allen and Rebecca Wells and uh, Richard Beckian and Whitfield. And uh, the other one in there is Joe Dorita. Some of you, some of you might recognize the name Joe Dorita. He's the most famous one of everybody in the movie because he ended up being Curly Joe in the last uh, edition of the uh, Three Stooges after Joe Besser left the group. 
He was never in any shorts, though. He was uh, in the feature films along with uh, the stage show that they did. The film's director, Richard Brooks, decided to play Rock Around the Clock over the opening credits of the film. Adults were shocked by the film's violent disobedience of the teenagers, but younger audiences' reactions were entirely different. In many cinemas, kids were dancing in the aisles when the song was played. In some theaters, there was a perceived link between rock and roll and rebellion, which led to abnormally bad behavior. A perception was born. Rock and roll led to juvenile delinquency. Meanwhile, Rock Around the Clock sold a million copies in March 1955. And juvenile delinquency became a subject in rock and roll, at least one song. Uh, I'm Not a Juvenile Delinquent by Frankie Lyman in The Teenagers on the Columbia Record. Uh, Frankie Lyman would be heavily involved in a number of things that happened in the early days of rock and roll. Not good things. Uh, rock and roll, it was about sex and violence. Uh, at least that was the perception. It also featured black musicians, which meant rock and roll was becoming a threat to society. In the 1950s, there was a worry that rock and roll would pull the white man down to the level of the Negro as part of a plot to undermine the morales of the youth of our nation. But there's an irony here. There's a major irony here as you look at Jerry Lee Lewis, whose cousin is Jimmy Lee Swaggart, uh, the uh, minister who uh, got in trouble twice with prostitutes. The first time he begged for forgiveness, did Jimmy Lee Swaggart. The second time he told his audience he, he spoke with God, God's cool with him, and it's none of your damn business what happened. But uh, this is the irony of it. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, the Pentecostal Church, Pentecostal Church inspired many first-generation rock and rollers like Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, and Johnny Cash, and Little Richard, and B.B. King, and others. They were raised or regularly attended Pentecostal services in their formative youth. Rock and roll, the soundtrack of rebellion, and the music of sideburn delinquents and teenage consumers owe the surprising debt to religion, gospel music, was a major factor. Also, uh, Aretha Franklin's father was a reverend in church. So you got the Pentecostal, Pentecostal church and gospel music. That's the irony. Oh, one other thing that made rock and roll music big was teenagers. They were able to buy the transistor radio. And the transistor radio meant that they could take music anywhere. Music and information suddenly became portable. No matter how isolated you were, you could hear the news of the world. Teenagers could listen to music anywhere they wanted. And that included being far away from an adult's ears. I uh, had a woman uh, a few weeks ago uh, in New Jersey uh, telling me that she stuffed her transistor radio in between the mattresses during the day. So when her mother cleaned the room, she wouldn't know that she had a transistor radio. And she listened to uh, rock and roll music uh, underneath the pillow as she was going to sleep. Uh, she had money. She had a job. The American economy was white hot at the time. Teenagers were able to go out and buy transistor radios and records. The transistor radio helped spark a musical revolution, rock and roll. Teenagers wanted their own music. The pop music of the early 50s was bland. I gave you the 1950s. Uh, top 10 of the year, 1950 top 10 of the year. Teenagers had pocket money. They worked part-time jobs. The American economy was white hot, and that swelled the disposable income of high schoolers and college kids. The independent-minded youth wanted their own sound. Why rock and roll? And how many of you who are of a certain age in the audience uh, wore poodle skirts or had the old DA haircuts or wore the white shoes um, and the dungarees and, and all of that. Uh, I've had quite a few uh, women who told me about how going to a sock hop was one of the greatest things that you could do as a teenager back in the day. Rock and roll, new style of music, which drew inspiration from African-American blues music, embraced themes popular among teenagers, such as young love, or as Paul Anker would have said, puppy love, and rebellion against authority. The uh, perfect storm, music aimed at teens in their pocketbooks and new technology. Rock and roll had arrived. 
Uh, wop, bop, a loop, bop, a wop, bomb, boom. To the fruity, on Rudy, Little Richard. It was released to the fruity in October 1955. A wop, bomb, a loop, bop, a wop, bomb, boom. Well, he wrote the lyric. Was it to describe a drum fill he wanted, or was it how he talked back to his boss, a dishwasher at the Macon, Georgia Greyhound Station? Released on Specialty 561, the record entered the Billboard Rhythm and Blues chart at the end of 1955 and rose to number two early in February 1956. Pat Boone's version of the song, though, did better on the charts. The New York Daily News called the music an insider of juvenile delinquency. The New York Daily News slogan in those days was tell it to Sweeney. And uh, Sweeney heard, at least from some people, uh, about how bad rock and roll was. And the New York Daily News pointed to the DJ, Alan Freed, who was at WINS at the time in New York, 1010 Wins New York, as the chief offender. Lil Richard said, they didn't want me to be in the white guy's way. I felt I was pushed into a rhythm and blues corner to keep the rockers out of the rockers' way because that's where the money is. When Tootie Fruity came out, they needed a rock star to block me out of white houses or homes because I was a hero to white kids. The white kids would have Pat Boone upon the dresser and me in the drawer because uh, they liked my version better. But the families didn't want me because of the image I was projecting. Tutti Frutti or Richard Penniman or Little Richard, his first career Billboard chart entry in 1952, debuting at number 12 on the bestsellers in stores chart that November and reaching number 17 on the most played in Jukebox's tally, 1956. But Pat Boone's cover did better in 1956. Just check that out. Check that out. Hey, Sherwin Williams is still in business. Something from 66 years ago, still in business, right? And so is the guy in the middle there, Pat Boone, rock star, Akron, Ohio, 66 years ago. Uh, now he's selling bathtubs with doors that open on the side so you don't have to climb over the side of the tub to get in. Uh, but there he is, Pat Boone, one of the first so-called rock and rollers. The covers. At the end of 1955, Pat Boone, notched his first number one hit with a rendition of Fats Domino's, Ain't That a Shame. Pat Boone said, but Lil Richard and Fats said they made more money from my versions crossing over into the mainstream. There's an interview with Lil Richard where he's asked about me and how he felt when he heard my version of the song and he said, I was washing dishes at the Greyhound bus station in Macon and when I heard Pat Boone doing my song, I threw down my towel. And I knew my time had come. A friend of mine by the name of Dean Shapiro, who uh, was uh, one time at NBC and uh, is uh, in the news division doing producing and writing and moved down to New Orleans to continue his career as a writer. I'm down in, uh, in New Orleans in 2007. And Dean says, let's go see Fats Domino. I said, don't you have to call us? No, don't worry about it. Takes me down to Fats' house. Fats is not there. But uh, there is Fats Domino's house in the Ninth Ward. It was restored uh, after Hurricane Katrina. And what you can't see here in this picture is uh, on the side of the uh, two sides of the roof, uh, the big part of the roof, uh, there were two, um, two massive dominoes. You could not miss Fats Domino's house. Uh, Pat Boone again. New Orleans, after we were doing both doing great, I was working at the Fairmont Hotel. He asked me to come over to Al Hurt's place, where he was playing. In the middle of his set, he held up one of his diamond rings and said to the audience, See this ring? This man, Pat Boone, bought me this ring. And we sang, Ain't That a Shame, together. Oh, Maybelline, why can't you be true? Oh, Maybelline. Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry. By the way, my uh, three-year-old granddaughter can't identify Johnny B. Good. One note. So could my daughter when she was that age. Uh, I put on Roll Over Beethoven the other day and she hears the opening. Say, I want John, she said, I want Johnny Be Good instead. I play Johnny Be Good instead. Maybelline, why can't you be true? St. Louis singer Chuck Berry ends up in Chicago to cut a song for Leonard Chess and Chess Records. It's called Ida May, which might have been based on a song called Ida Red. Leonard Chess likes the song, but it might be too similar to Ida Red. 
Simple solution, though. Get a new name. That's the problem. And that was a problem. So nobody could think of a name, pianist Johnny Johnson says. We looked up on the windowsill, and there was a mascara box up there with Maybelline written on it. Leonard Chess said, why don't we name the damn thing Maybelline? Oh, Maybelline, why don't you be true? There is Chuck Berry. Maybelline quickly rose to number one on the R&B charts in August 1955. It was number five on the pop chart. At WINS in New York, the disc jockey, Ellen Freed, played the song for two straight hours one night. Near Memphis, an unknown singer named Elvis Presley, he was pretty unknown at this point, began to include the song in his own performances. This guy's name is Acer Carter. Library probably has some of his books under the name Forrest Carter, which he wrote in the 1970s. But I'm jumping a little ahead of myself talking about Forrest Carter, the author, best-selling author, as a matter of fact. April 7th, 1956, Billboard magazine, segregationists would ban all rock roll hits. High school and college students, tavern owners and restaurant owners, radio stations, and most of all jukebox operators are up in arms over a declaration by a white citizens council led uh, group that rock and roll has got to go. Asa Carter, executive secretary of the North Alabama Council said at a rally meeting that rock and roll was, in, uh, was inspired by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and other pro-integration forces. He indicated that the council would punish the names of music operators and location owners who failed to ban the records. April 18, 1956, Time Magazine, White Council vs. Rock and Roll. April 18, 1956, the White Citizens Council of Alabama formed to fight desegregation, equally opposed to jazz, which they consider part of the NAACP's plot to mongrelize America. Asa E. Ace Carter, self-appointed leader of the North Alabama Citizens Council, said last week that bebop, rock and roll, and all Negro music are designed to force Negro culture on the South. I don't want to be a Jew. I'm not a juvenile delinquent. Well, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, they're back in the middle of it. It's Asbury Park, New Jersey. It's 1956. Frankie Lyman and the teenagers were stars in Asbury Park. Uh, Joseph, William, and Albert Rydiker, uh, jewelers who had been leasing the convention hall from the city for 10 years, were looking for a rock and roll act to book for a summer show at the venue. The Rydikers uh, booked them, Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, for the show at the convention hall on June 30th, 1956. These guys are teenagers, right? What are they doing on stage at 11 o'clock? Huh? Anyway. When Lyman and the teenagers took the stage, before the clock struck 11, kids in the audience pressed forward on the floor to get a closer look. The teenagers had barely started their second song when a fight broke out. Asbury Park police were called to the scene and restored order, but fighting broke out again, and by midnight, Joseph Rydecker had called off the show, and nearly 3,000 disappointed teenagers spilled out onto the boardwalk. More fights broke out. According to newspaper accounts at the time, Asbury Park police called for a backup, eventually summoning, summoning police officers from as far away as Red Bank and Long Branch, New Jersey. 25 people were injured, although most suffered only cuts and bruises, and dozens of teenagers were taken into custody, although the police only filed charges against eight of them. No more rock and roll shows. We've had it with rock and roll music. Convention Hall, Boardwalk, Asbury Park, New Jersey. New Jersey's largest dance floor, 3,000 uh, comfortable seats, dance and show, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, Freddie Price and his entire orchestra, get in for a buck 80, which now is about 36 bucks, somewhere around 36 bucks. Starts at 8, ends at 1 a.m. Time Magazine again, July 23rd, 1956. After a riot in Asbury Park, New Jersey's convention hall that sent 25 vibrating teenagers to the hospital, Mayor Roland J. Hines slapped a rock and roll band on all city dance halls. Taking the hint, Jersey City canceled Jasmine 
Paul Whiteman's Rock and Roll Under the Stars show at the 24,000 seat Roosevelt Stadium. And some of you old Brooklyn Dodger fans out there, you might remember that Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, players were forced to go to Jersey City to play nine games uh, in 1956, nine games in 1957, because the Dodgers owner, Walter O'Malley, wanted to put the squeeze on Robert Moses to get Moses to build a new baseball park in Brooklyn. Bill Haley and his comments were among the groups shut out by the Jersey City band and put a defensive sorts on records on choruses of a ditty called Teenager's Mother. Sample lyrics uh, defend the band's actions. Teenage, teenager's Mother, are you so right? Did uh, you forget so soon how much you like to do the Charleston? Now, the teenager's mother here is probably, let's say, the Charleston 2526. 31 years later, so the teenager's mother, probably about 47 and 48 at this point, at this point, and uh, probably, uh, they probably didn't give rock and roll a second thought, but um, Bill Haley decided he was going to complain about these bands. Bo Diddley, there he is, Elvis Presley's peg leg, uh, peg pants and gyrating hips, and Bo Diddley's use of his uh, guitar as a phallic symbol, were not very professional on stage, according to some. Um, Sam Phillips and Elvis. Sam Phillips founded Sun Studios in 1950. As a producer at Sun, he became one of the first white Southerners to record the great Memphis bluesmen, like, uh, like Howling Wolf and B.B. King. Sam Phillips was looking for a white guy who could sing like a black guy. In 1954, Sam would find that man in Elvis Presley, and together they would create the music that came to be known as rockabilly. Phillips talking. He was working for Crown Electric. He was a truck driver for uh, the local firm, uh, local business, uh, Elvis was. I'd seen that truck go back and forth outside, and I thought, we're sure doing a hell of a lot of business around here. But I never saw it stop anywhere. So Elvis, he had case to join for a long time before he stopped the truck and got out. And there's no telling how many days and nights behind that wheel he's figuring out some way to come in and make a record without saying, Mr. Phillips, would you audition me? So his mother's birthday gave him the opportunity to come in and make a little personal record. And there was Sam and there was Elvis. It wasn't anything that striking about Elvis except the sideburns. Well, they were, they were down to here, which I kind of thought, well, you know, that's pretty cool, man. Ain't no one else got them that damn long. We talked in the studio. I played the record for him in the control room on the little crystal turntable. Walked up front, told Marion. It was, uh, Marion was uh, Philip's secretary, Girl Friday, and business partner, I guess. Uh, to write down Elvis's name and number, how we could get a hold of him. Phillips didn't want Elvis to be a ballad singer. Phillips put a band together for Elvis with Scotty Moore on guitar and Bill Black on bass and started to record Elvis. I knew he had the fundamentals of what I wanted. He was the first one I had seen who had that potential. I had a different type of voice, and this boy had listened to a lot of different music, from Grand Old Opry, Bing Crosby, Dinah Shore, to Crowley, to Bill Monroe, to Hank Snow. That's all right, Mama. That's all right with, that's Arthur Big Daddy Crudup who uh, wrote that song, That's All Right Mama. And it's the first hit. It's on Sun Records. Elvis, Scotty, and Bill. Uh, and that's Grand Old Opry in 20, 2002 when I was in uh, Nashville 20 years ago. Um, and I happened to be uptown where uh, this one is. Uh, but where I saw the show was the Rydman Auditorium, the old uh, church, the cathedral. That's great. I, yeah, I figure I, I'm in Nashville. I got to do Wild Tootsie's Orchid and uh, Grand Old Opry and the uh, Iron Horse Saloon. You got to do, do the whole circuit, right? And uh, so um, I went. It was a great show. Uh, Porter Wagner was the master of ceremonies, uh, Travis Twitt, and uh, little Jimmy Dickin, uh, Dinkins, uh, Dickens, little Jimmy Dickens uh, did the duet. Travis is what, 6'7, and little Jimmy Dickens was 4'10. May the blue bird of happiness fly up your nose. That was a Johnny Carson joke for a long time. Anyway, Elvis does go to the Grand Old Opry. It's October 2nd, 1954, and it doesn't go over well. 
one of the Opry officials uh, reportedly suggesting that Elvis go back to driving a truck. Elvis, Scotty, and Bill quit their day jobs mid-October. They appear on the Louisiana Hayride, a live Saturday night country music radio show originating in Shreveport, Louisiana, broadcasting over uh, KWKH Radio. The show is uh, the Grand Old Opry's chief competitor. Uh, it's carried by 190 stations in the South, 13 states. And Elvis does well. They like him. There's Elvis and uh, at the Louisiana Hayride. This leads to regular appearances at the Hayride in November of 54. He signs a one-year contract for 52 Saturday night appearances. It's the big break. He has records and a regional gig. Elvis, 1955. There you go. On November 21st, 1955, Philip sells Elvis's contract to RCA Records. I had looked at everything for how I could take a little extra money and get myself out of a real bad. I mean, I wasn't broke, but man, it was hand to mouth. Made an offer to Tom Parker. But the whole thing was I made an offer. I didn't think they'd even consider $35,000. Now about $750,000. $700,000. Plus, I owed Elvis uh, four or $5,000. Rock and roll artists had not proven themselves yet. Elvis worked hard, sold some records, but was a middle-level performer on the circuit. Elvis recorded 24 songs at Sun Studio in Memphis between 53 and 55. Blues, rhythm and blues, gospel, country, western, hillbilly, rockabilly, bluegrass, uh, the recordings were inducted into the U.S. Congress's National Recording Registry in 2002. 1956, stardom, and it comes real quick. I mean, real quick. January 10th, Elvis records Heartbreak Hotel. January 28th, Elvis makes his first national TV appearance on CBS TV's stage show, uh, singing, I've Got a Woman. That's Ray Charles did that. Shake, Rattle, and Roll, Big Joe Turner, and Flip, Flop, and Fly. February 11th, Heartbreak Hotel is released. April 3rd, he appears on the Texaco Store Theater with Milton Berle. April 6th, his dream comes true. He becomes an actor, or at least on the road to being an actor, as Paramount Studios signs Elvis to a seven-year deal. June 5th, he returns to the Burl Show and sings Hound Dog and jerks his hips and legs. Elvis the Pelvis is obscene. Wow, that was quick. Gets uh, to RCA in November 55, and by summer 56, could have been a has-been. Elvis the Pelvis, this is Bob Hull's column. The teenage singing idol who made his break into the big time a short while ago on the Milton Burl Show helps Uncle Milty close out his season tonight. Hull in the L.A. Herald Examiner TV Talk column, June 5th. No one knows how the nickname started, but to some, it was meant to diminish his talents. Well, he goes on the Steve Allen show after uh, Milton Brawl show, and there he is, Elvis, Steve Allen, and the Bassett Hat. Steve Allen was competing against um, Ed Sullivan on Sunday night when the show booked Elvis for its July 1st show. It would bring Allen some badly needed eyeballs in front of the TV screens. Now. I never understood this, but I broke into journalism in the 1970s, and by that point, newspapers, had their uh, influence had dimin diminished uh, greatly, although I was a paper boy in 1968, and I delivered an afternoon paper, so there were morning and afternoon papers still in the 1970s. But in the 1950s, columnists like Charles Mercer and Walter Winchell, Winchell Heather Hopper, uh, Earl Wilson were big deals. They were really important, among others. Uh, and Mercer was among those who uh, urged Steve Allen to cancel Presley's appearance on the show. NBC uh, weighed in on Elvis's shenanigans. We think uh, this lad has a great future, a network spokesman said, but we won't stand for any bad taste under any circumstances. Steve Allen, the taming of Elvis. Well, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago on the Milton Berle show, our next guest, Elvis Presley, received a great deal of attention, which some people seem to interpret one way and some viewers interpret it another. Uh, naturally, it's our intention to do nothing but a good show. We want to do a good show. Uh, the whole family can watch and, and enjoy, and we always do it. Tonight, we're presenting 
Elvis Presley in his, uh, what you might call his first comeback. Elvis, the Hound Dog, and Steve L, who was a proficient writer of songs uh, in his day, uh, including this may be the start of something big. Most newspaper columnists took delight in Steve Allen's cutting Elvis down to size. Rock and roll seemed to threat, seemed to threat to the establishment. Elvis was humiliated. The next night, Elvis is on stage for a performance in his hometown of Memphis and says, you know, those people in New York aren't going to change me none. I'm going to show you what the real Elvis is like tonight. And Ed Sullivan was watching what Steve Allen's numbers were. And he decided, I'm going to hire this kid for my show. Ed Sullivan said Elvis would never appear on the show due to his perceived obscenity by the establishment. But Sullivan changed his mind when the Steve Allen show beat him in the ratings uh, due to uh, Presley's appearance on July 1st. Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, negotiated the highest fee ever paid to an act by Sullivan and at that point in time, increasing the fee from 5000 to over 16000 per show. In August, the judge in Jacksonville, Florida threatened Presley with jail time if he did not restrain himself during his live concerts there on August 10th and 11th. Elvis was reduced to moving only his pinky finger. And there is Elvis, and uh, Bill Black is there, and Scotty Moore is there, Jordan the nearest. September 9th, Elvis did make his first appearance on The Sullivan Show. Sullivan had been injured in a car crash, didn't host the show. The English actor Charles Lawton was the master of ceremonies that night in New York. Elvis brought in 60 million viewers. Elvis was in L.A. and through the magic of at t telephone lines and microwave uh, connections and coaxial cable, Elvis was live. Elvis appeared for a second time on The Sullivan Show in New York. Um, on October 28th, Ed was back for that one. Viewers saw a head-to-toe sight of Elvis performing Love Me Tender, Don't Be Cruel, and Hound Dog. Problems started again because of the gyrations. On January 6, 1957, Elvis made his final Sullivan appearance. He was shot from the waist up. Oh, one other thing. You know, there is a polio outbreak in Rockland County right now. And uh, 1955 was the year that uh, Salk came up with the polio vaccine. But a lot of teenagers didn't want to take that vaccine. There were people like Walter Winchell who said the government ordered all of the great number of little white coffins for all of the kids who are going to be killed from taking the shot. So there was some reluctancy uh, because of people like Winchell uh, taking the shot. But uh, he got the shot uh, in front of millions of people before an Ed Sullivan show. Uh, the vaccination rates among American youth skyrocketed to 80% just after six months. When Elvis got the shot, immunization levels among American teens were at 0.6%. Sam Phillips had other discoveries, as you can see him there with Johnny Cash. It's Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, Roy Orbison. Elvis, Cash, Lewis, and Perkins uh, would be part of ushering in a new sound of music, which, by the way, debuted on Broadway in 1956, The Sound of Music. Uh, there was one recording session from 1956 featuring all four performers, which was called the Million Dollar Quartet. Carl Perkins inspired the Beatles, worked with Paul McCartney and George Harrison and Ringo Starr. Johnny Cash recorded with McCartney. Roy Orbison was part of George Harrison's Traveling Wilburys. Perkins' career would be hampered by a car crash. Girl can help it, girl can help it. Well, Richard saw It's a movie about rock and roll, which starred uh, Jane Mansfield's boobs, Jane Mansfield's wiggle, and a whole bunch of uh, rock and rollers uh, singing songs. And Ray Anthony is in that, in that movie, too, and he certainly wasn't a, a rock and roller. Um, the girl can't help it. There seems to be some story about a gangster who wants to turn his girlfriend into a rock star. But the real stars of the movie, the rock and roll performers, not Tom Yule and Jane. Well, I should take that back. Certain parts of Jane Mansfield was the star. Anyway, uh, Little Richard performed the title track. Fats Domino, Eddie Cochran, and Gene Vincent, who had the huge hit, Beep Bop Lula. Again, the song my granddaughter's like, and they're three and one are featured. 
The film got the attention of a 16-year-old named John Lennon in Liverpool, England. Cochran performed 20 Flight Rock, which caught the attention of a 14-year-old Paul McCartney in Liverpool. 19 songs were in the movie. Gogi Grant was not a rock and roller. 1956 Top 10, Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis. Don't Be Cruel, Elvis. Lisbon, Antigua, Nelson Riddle, who was working with Frank Sinatra at the time, certainly not a rock and roll song. My Prayer, The Platters, R&B group, The Way With Wind, which we used to play in 1978 ad nauseum as part of Al Ham's Music of Your Life format, uh, The Way With Wind by Gogi Grant, The Poor People of Paris, uh, Les Baxter, K. Sera, Sera, Whatever Will Be Will Be, Doris Day, whose son uh, Ter uh, Terry Melcher uh, was targeted by Charles Manson in 1969. Uh, he was a record producer. Hound Dog by Elvis. Memories Made of This. Dean Martin, who is not a rock and roller, but Dean Martin influenced a whole bunch of rock and rollers, including Elvis Presley. And the Rock and Roll Waltz by K Star, which is a dreadful song that they kept putting in the words Rock and Roll Waltz. Now, you may disagree with me, but to me, it's a dreadful song. Long Live Rock, that's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. There's money to be made, Rock and Roll, a Teenager's Must, Billboard Magazine, November 10th, 1956. Rock and Roll is no longer a novelty. Its honeymoon period with teenagers is over and the reappraisal of its present appeal and future potential is taking place on the radio station management level. 79 of 179 managers participating in Billboard survey admitted that they have had to continually increase the programming of rock and roll due to public opinion. The typical management attitude today is that a judicious amount of rock and roll, time for peak teenage hours, is obligatory. While there may have been complaints and alienation within other listening segments of the population because of the excess exposure of rock and roll, most analysts agree that the current music is here to stay. Well, maybe not. Rock and roll gets knocked down a whole bunch of pegs starting in 1957. The Big Beat and Jim Crow. Jim Crow rears its ugly head in this one. On May 4th, 1957, The Big Beat with Alan Freed becomes the first nationally televised rock and roll dance show. The ABC TV show was a summer replacement and would continue into the 57-58 TV season if it attracted an audience. And for that first show, it did. The TV show featured a live performance by Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers. But what goes up must come down because Lyman was shown dancing with a white girl. The dance scene enraged ABC's Southern affiliates and the networks canceled the program even before the credits, uh, the credits rolled, as you can see in Ellen Freed's face. Well, there was a show that could be a replacement, though. It was called Bandstand. It started in 1952 in Philadelphia. It was a radio show. And back in those days, uh, television would try anything, any kind of programming it could get its hands on. So why not take Bandstand, which was on the Philadelphia radio station, and put it on TV? In October 7, 1952, WFIL, which is uh, now WPI, PVI in Philadelphia, Channel 6, uh, debuted an afternoon series called Bandstand. Bandstand featured teenagers dancing to the records of crooners and Frankie Lane. He was definitely a crooner. Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett is also a favorite of rock stars, uh, many rock stars. Perry Como and Eddie Fisher. Bob Horn took the radio version of Bandstand to television. Lee Stewart was the co-host. Bob Horn would be replaced by Dick Clark on Bandstand on July 9th, 1956. Horn's trouble stemmed from his alcoholism and alleged predatory sexual behavior. Oh, there he is, the angelic-looking Dick Clark. And if you look behind him, Hound Dog is the number one song uh, on Bandstand. Clark would take the show from a local Philadelphia program to a national audience in 1957. The name of the program changed to American Bandstand, and there they are, dancing uh, on the floor with Dick Clark there just watching. Clark pitched the uh, program to WFIL-TV's parent company, ABC, as a cheap, 
an easy way to appeal to the youth demographic, which the third ranking, uh, ABC, uh, desperately wanted to target. On August 5th, 1957, ABC aired the first national broadcast of American Bandstand, still filmed in Philadelphia from 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern. Uh, it became an immediate rating smash, and two days later, Paul Anka, you can see in Westbury, or could have seen in Westbury earlier this year, became the first performer to make his national debut during a television appearance, singing his new song, Diana. And just think, Diana probably now is about 82, 83, 84 years old. By February 1958, daily viewership had reached 8.4 million people, making American Bandstand ABC TV's top-rated television program. Uh, the TV debuts of Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel as uh, Tom and Jerry took place November 22, 1956. Jerry Lee Lewis um, started uh, his TV career on March 18, 1958 in Dion and the Belmonts from Belmont Avenue down the road here a little bit uh, in, uh, in Little Italy uh, on Arthur Avenue on August 7, 1958. Elvis buys Graceland. Rock and roll was blazing in 57, but all things must come to an end. Elvis had four hits uh, in 1957, 25 weeks, number one. ABC takes uh, Bandstand National after five years in WFIL in Philadelphia. Dick Clark is uh, the host. Jerry Lee Lewis emerges. <laughs> Bill Haley and his Comets complete a successful world tour, including the UK, Europe, and Australia. Little Richard continues ripping up the charts with four hit singles concurrently on both the pop and R&B charts, including Lucille. Uh, April of 1957, the Dell Vikings, number four on the U.S. pop chart, number two on the rhythm and blues chart, debut single, Come and Go With Me, Down to the Sea. But John Lennon didn't hear those lyrics. Oh, Nat King Cole once did a song, released a song called uh, Mr. Cole Won't Rock and Roll. It's part of uh, a package uh, live at the Sands, and he goes through a whole bunch of songs at the end of, uh, in, within the song, and um, references Elvis, among others. And uh, he says at the end of the song, Mr. Cole won't rock and roll, but I could if I wanted to. He did. He did Cry, which was the uh, Johnny Ray song. Oh, Johnny Ray is never considered a rock and roller. Uh, and uh, Send For Me, song written by Ollie Jones, performed by Nat King Cole, featuring the McCoy Boys, reached number one on the U.S. R&B chart and number six on the U.S. pop chart, 1957. Little Richard's record sold in 1957. Bat Boone was not doing Little Richard covers. Come and go with me down to the penitentiary. This is July 6, 1957, and a, uh, a group called the Quarrymen are performing at a church fete in Liverpool. The annual Walton Parish Church Garden Fete, Paul McCart, rather John Lennon and his Quarrymen Skiffle group played. Uh, there was a 15-year-old by the name of Paul McCartney. He came complete with a guitar on his back. He's watching. He's impressed by Lennon's ability to ad lib in place of forgotten lyrics in songs like Come and Go With Me to the Penitentiary. Um, Eddie Cochran had done 20 Flight Rock, and McCartney became quite proficient at 20 Flight Rock. Ivan Vaughn knows both Lennon and McCartney, and uh, he introduces them to get to each other. Paul pulls out the, his guitar that he's carrying. Why is he going there with a guitar on his back? Was he going to audition? Does he know he's going to audition? And he begins to play Eddie Cochran's 20 Flight Rock, then Gene Vincent's Beep Bop Alula, and then a medley of Little Richard hits. He's better than what Lennon has on stage, by the way. Uh, even at the age, at this point, he is just uh, 14 years old. Lennon, uh, rather, Lennon invites McCartney to join the group, and he joins two weeks later. The Everleys out of Nashville. Now, they were important to Nashville. They were the first consistently successful rock and roll act, although I'm not sure how rock and roll they are, to come from there. 
uh, their management and their songs came from Nashville and they recorded there with local uh, session musicians. 1957, the Everleys had a string of hits, including Bye Bye Love, Wake Up Little Susie, All I Have to Do is Dream, Bird Dog, and others. They became Grand Ole Opry members on June 1st, 1957. But the end is near. Sound like Frank Sinatra, Paul Anker song, uh, My Way. The end is near. And it's near for the originators in 1958. Rock and roll comes to a halt. The adults win. Rock and roll pioneers are elsewhere due to various reasons. Uh, Elvis joins the army. There he is, getting his hair cut. He was inducted in March 1958, two weeks after wrapping up his movie King Creole, for which he sang part of the soundtrack. He trained at Fort Hood, Texas, but he was able to take breaks to record music meaning he had a back catalog ready for his return. According to John Lennon, Elvis died creatively when he joined the Army. Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, Little Richard, and Fats Domino would fill the void. Little Richard goes to Bible school. He's torn between the devil and the deep blue sea. He doesn't know what to do. Uh, Penniman gave up music in 1957, began attending the Alabama Bible School, Oakwood College, where he was eventually ordained a minister. He would have one more hit, Number one hit uh, in 1958, Good Golly Miss Molly. He never hit the top 10 again after 1958. Oh, Jerry Lee Lewis married his 13-year-old cousin. Not a good thing to do. At the age of 13, Myra Brown married Jerry Lee Lewis in Hernando, Mississippi on December 12, 1957. When Lewis arrived in London for a 37-day tour in May 1958, Brown revealed to a reporter at the airport she was his wife. Lewis asserted that Brown was 15, which made it better, right? She's 15. And his wife of two months. Uh, the British tabloids ripped Lewis to shreds, and his career took a nosedive right into the concrete. George Harrison joined the Quarrymen uh, February 6, 1958. Uh, George Harrison is all of 14 years old. He joins the Liverpool Skiffle Group, the Quarrymen. Harrison is added to the lineup of John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Len Gary, Eric Griffiths, and John Lowe. Harrison was recommended to Lennon by McCartney, though Lennon initially resisted because he felt Harrison of 14 was too young. He was also short at 14. Harrison got in by playing the then hit Raunchy. The group recorded two songs in 1958, Buddy Holly's That Would Be That Would Be the Day and a Harrison, uh, rather McCartney Harrison composition, in spite of all the danger, which Paul still plays to this day. Band in Boston, uh, May 3rd, 1958 show at the Boston Arena was a major problem for Alan Free as he was charged with inciting a riot. 1958, he MC'd and managed the 17 act Big Beat show, featured Jerry Lee Lewis, oh that guy again, Frankie Lyman, Chuck Berry and Danny and the Juniors. Kids packed into the aisle singing along and dancing, but things started to get a little out of hand. A few beer bottles were broken. A scuffle broke out. Police stopped the show. Fifteen people were beaten and robbed in the streets after the show. None of the perpetrators were ever caught. The only arrest made following the melee was Alan Freed, who was charged with inciting a riot. The case never went to trial. On May 5th, the mayor, John D. Hines, Banned rock and roll shows in the city of Boston. These so-called, those so-called rock and roll music programs are a disgrace and must be stopped. As far as I'm concerned, Boston has seen the last of them. Other East Coast cities banned rock and roll shows. And Mr. Freed would go to Washington. Payola and rock and roll. Payola, the paying of cash and gifts in exchange for airplay, been around since the days of Jolson when radio started in the 1920s. The adults. The establishment felt threatened by rock and roll and a changing lifestyle. It's time to kill off rock and roll and go after disc jockeys for bribery. Alan Freed. Alan Freed and Dick Clark both played important part, parts in the rise of rock and roll. Clark refused to play white cover versions of black songs such as Papoons to the Fruity. Freed ended up taking the fall for DJs everywhere. His career? ruined. He lost his job at WABC in New York. Freed was defiant. Clark looks squeaky clean. Now, uh, Mitch Levy is the guy in the blue sweater there. Uh, Larry Strickler is at the end of, to your left. He was a child star in the Milton Berle show. Shelley Strickler, his wife, was on WOR radio for a long time. 
Mitch uh, took Ellen Freed's place at the Sock Cup. He was a 16-year-old disc jockey at WINS Radio in 1958. And at the age of 80, he is an overnight uh, newsman at WINS, uh, where he began his career and where he may very well end up his career. The day the music died, that's uh, Diamond Dave Somerville of uh, the Diamonds. And he and I had a very long talk. I don't know if uh, uh, his book uh, called uh, The Boys on the Bus is in the library, Dave Somerville. And it's all about tours of the late 1950s by all the rock and rollers and all. And uh, Dave uh, was telling me uh, he knew Buddy Holly. He wasn't on that particular tour when Holly is killed. Uh, the day the music died, February 3rd, 1959, three performers, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and JP, the Big Bopper Richardson. Uh, this is the Big Bopper talking. Uh, joined uh, their pilot, Roger Peterson, for what was supposed to be a flight to their next uh, tour stop in Iowa. Uh, but the passengers and the pilot never made it uh, to their destination. Instead, the four were involved in a deadly crash in Iowa that took the lives of the four of them. The day the music died. Dave traveled with Buddy Holly on tours. He said Buddy wanted to take a warm bath and get off the bus. He got on the plane for the next gig. The plane crashed. He also said that Buddy was through with rock and roll. He wanted to go on to something else. Uh, he didn't want to do the same uh, music that he was doing. And uh, he, the only reason he was on tours because you made money on the tours. Uh, so he did it for money. Uh, Paul Anka and Fabian were brought in to finish the tour. While it's known as the day the music died, one of the earlier tour stops was in Duluth, Minnesota. And Buddy Holly left an impression on the teenager, teenager by the name of Robert Zimmerman, who would later be known as Bob Dylan. Ray Charles, what I say, what I say. Well, he's still around, uh, and he's doing well until he's, you know, they get, they uh, catch him with heroin, right? What I say was created when the singer somehow ran out of material near the end of a gig in Brownsville, Pennsylvania. He began playing a rollicking riff, improvising lyrics over it, telling his backup singers, the Raylettes, uh, I'm going to fool around, y'all just follow me. Uh, Ray delivered an instant classic in the call and response style. Song does become a problem. It's too long, have a lyric, shake that thing, and uh, Ray is doing, uh, 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 and the Ray Lutz are doing, ah, uh, ah, uh, and the orgasmic sounds become a major problem. What I say was banned by many black and white radio stations. Mr. Freed goes to Washington, November 1959, in closed and open sessions before the House Oversight Committee, 335 disc jockeys from around the country admitted to having received over $263,000 in consulting fees. That figure was only the tip of the iceberg payola before the hearings Phil Lynn, a DJ at Chicago's WAIT radio, confessed he had once taken $22,000 to play a single record. The trial heated up when the two most influential jocks in the country took the stand. Alan Freed took the fall. Phil Lynn was still working in the 1990s. Oh, look at him, Dick Clark, he looks so angelic. Dick Clark divested himself of all incriminating connections he had, part ownership in seven indie labels, six publishers, three record distributors, two talent agencies, ABC said, get rid of it, bury the evidence. He did. The committee chair, or Oren Harris, called him a fine young man. Clark was in the clear. In 1960, Congress amended the Federal Communications Act to outlaw under the table payments and require broadcasters to disclose that the airplay for a song had been purchased. Payola became a misdemeanor with a penalty of up to $10,000 in fines and one year in prison. The end. Chuck Berry, chess recording star in his orchestra. Actually, Chuck Berry, I saw him 30 years ago at uh, the uh, Plaza Hotel. He was doing a corporate gig that night. I was covering the National Hockey League player strike. And I hear music in, in the next room, and there's only two of us there, Bob Trader and me. And I open the door, and there's Chuck Berry. He is basically trying out guitar players because he didn't travel with a band. He paid up 50 bucks for the night to, to do uh, the riffs. And you got Chuck Berry, and you got a bunch of unknowns. 
Chuck took all the money and gave them next to nothing. Anyway, uh, rock and roll became sanitized. Raw sounds are gone. Ricky Nelson, Tommy Sands, Bobby B, Bobby Rydell, Frankie Avalon, Fabian, Del Shannon are the teen idols. Elvis Little Richard, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lee Lewis history. December 23rd, 1959, Chuck Berry's arrested in St. Louis on charges relating to his transportation of a 14-year-old girl across state lines for allegedly immoral purposes. He's convicted on March 11th, 1960, sentenced to five years in jail, $5,000 fine. But uh, the conviction is vacated and a new trial ordered by a federal appeals court in October 1960 because the judge made disparaging racial comments in the trial. Double jeopardy? Who knows? Uh, but he'd be convicted again and uh, would go to prison in 1961. Well, that's it. It's bland again in 1960. The rawness of rock and roll faded from the charts. Theme from a summer place, Percy Faith. He'll have to go, Jim Reeves, Kathy's Clown, the Everly Brothers, Running Bear, Johnny Preston, Teen Angel, Mark Dining. Uh, I'm sorry, Brenda Lee. It's now or never. Elvis, handyman, Jimmy Jones. Stuck on you, Elvis? And the twist at number 10. The twist would usher in a new phase of rock and roll. The old guys are done. Anyway, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me.